Hey friends, here we are. We are in week three and it's our last one of this Afterlife series where we are talking about the Easter story, the resurrection story. And I gotta be honest, this series has, has absolutely blessed me. Matter of fact, I can be straight up transparent and tell you that I have seen things that I have never seen before from this post-resurrection story. Like think about the people who have seen Jesus when he was resurrected and and, and um, I think it's incredible. And so uh, this whole series has been amazing. You are loved, you matter. And I wanna leave you with this, this one last thought, but before we move on, I gotta be honest and I gotta tell you about something that I did that was actually despicable. Okay, you can't judge me, but I gotta tell you about something that I did that was despicable. Um, I worked at a camp one day and there was this one kid by the name of Isaiah. Yes, I said his name, I revealed his identity. His name is Isaiah. And at the time he was 13, 14, and we just kind of had the little friendly tit for tat pranks, you know, kind of stuff, right? Just friendly camp stuff that you would do at camp, right? Just fun, fun love, you know, that type of thing. There was one particular day where I was actually the canoe instructor. And of course, as a canoe instructor, you watch people, you know, go on canoes. And then occasionally, a keyword occasionally, you would actually go out on your canoe and just be with kids and have fun and point to beavers and point to little leeches and all the little stupid stuff, right? <laughs> but there's one particular moment where Isaiah actually invites me in to this canoe. I was like, no, nah, I don't wanna, you know. I don't want to be in this canoe. I'm just enjoying having a tan. You know what I mean? Getting extra dark mocha, right? And so he was like, no, Bradford, come on, join us in the canoe. Come on, I'll have some fun. It's the summer, YOLO, you live only once. Come on, enjoy it. Come in the canoe. And of course he got the whole, the whole crowd, the whole cabin saying this, like Bradford, 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 like screaming. And of course, as someone who does not back down from a challenge, I was like, okay, I'll join in the canoe. And of course, as I'm stepping into this canoe, he gives us this little tiny little devilish smirk. And as I'm stepping in this canoe, and you know exactly what's about to happen, I'm stepping to this canoe and he like starts to shake it, right? And I'm like shaking and I'm screaming like, stop, stop. I mean, a, I mean, a grown big man, like stop, like don't, don't, don't shake it. And he's shaking it, he's like ooh, ha, ha, ooh, and like shaking his stuff. And then lo and behold, he flipped me and I had my phone. I had my phone on me, he flipped the canoe and I'm of course in the water and I can swim of course, but I was humiliated, I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, I was soaked, my phone thankfully was not destroyed because of the rice, yay, yay. I love rice. Anyways, but, I, but it was I, like I was ashamed. Now, what he did not know in that moment is that you don't ever, ever, ever mess with Big Fudge, ever. So, of course, me in my position, I abused my power a little bit. I got all the guys, all the cabin leaders, I said, guys, will you choose to serve me this day or will you choose to make alliance with that little kid? They said, Bradford, we're going to help you. And so, of course, I'm planning what to do this night. And so he's asleep, right? I was waiting for the perfect opportunity to get this little turd back. This particular day, I'm planning this, and of course I got my guys, and I wait till he sleep. <laughs> so he sleep, it was like 2.30 in the morning, and I filled big industrial buckets full of water. Full of water, okay? Not just two, sorry, three buckets full of water. So at 2.30 in the morning, me and my guys, like my Motley crew, I was like, we're gonna get him back, right? So I took these buckets and I dumped it all over Isaiah and it, like, there was a moment I thought he, he was drowning, like legit. He woke up, he's like, <gasps> <laughs> like it was terrible. And after that whole thing, when we're like laughing and, and we got it on tape, the next day happened, of course, we're all like laughing and enjoying it. And then he said, Bradford, you destroyed my alarm clock, you destroyed my CD player, and you destroyed my watch that my mother gave me. And I was like, ooh, 
oh, that's heavy. And I felt bad. I felt guilty. I felt terrible for what I have done. And 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 I had some great laughs. And, and to this day, like we're, we're fine, we're good, and we laugh at that. But I did something pretty, pretty bad, and, and I really felt bad. And yes, I did pay him back, and I did pay him back for the stuff that I ruined. But that particular day, I didn't feel the best about myself. And, and so today, we're gonna talk about guilt. Have you ever felt guilty about something? When was the last time you felt guilt about something? See, guilt can sometimes be a bit confusing, right? Guilt is something uh, that, you know, I've done something wrong, right? We confuse guilt over shame, like guilt is something that I've done, but shame is, is you know, I am something bad, but guilt is kind of a, a natural human thing to feel when you feel bad about something or, or when you feel like you've done something bad. Guilt is that thing inside of you that turns on when something is not right or when you are not living as you should. And maybe you have felt guilt this week or last month or last year. We've all have felt guilty. Maybe for you, you felt guilty about how you treated your sibling on the way here, like to youth group. <laughs> maybe you feel guilty about how you treated someone online on Instagram or Snapchat or Discord or whatever. Maybe you feel guilt about maybe something that you watched that was a little too far, a little, little too on edge, maybe a little something that you just shouldn't watch. Maybe you felt guilt about how you treated your neighbor or your best friend or in, in, in sports or in class. We've all have felt guilt about something. But the thing about guilt is actually pretty interesting, right? Like when we feel guilt, our natural human response is to do what? It's to run. It's to hide. And so we avoid the person that we offended. We avoid the person that we've hurt. We avoid our parents. We avoid church. We avoid youth group. We avoid, and most importantly, we avoid God. And usually when we hide, we kind of do these little little hiding tricks, right? We, we, we try to lie. We try to cover it up. We try to uh, not make eye contact. We ghost people. We leave people on red. And we play it cool as if nothing happened, mainly because no one wants to feel terrible about themselves. No one wants to feel terrible about what they've done. We want to feel like we're winning. But when we lose, it doesn't feel right. And so we try to hide and we try to run. And most importantly, we try to run and try to hide from God. But what's funny about that is because we can never really run from God. We can never really hide from God. What, what we can do is that we can choose to walk away from God and back away from our relationship with him, including our friends and our family. And then soon you know it, you feel far from God. And these moments are, are, are hard and they hurt because when you feel far from God, it feels a bit cold, it feels a bit stale, it feels like something is missing from my life. But as we look into the Easter story one last time, we will see that the Easter story, the resurrection story, tells a different story about how God approaches our guilt. You see, in the last few weeks, we've looked at two people that has encountered the resurrection of Jesus, that, that when they've encountered the resurrected life of Jesus, their lives were, were changed. I mean, who wouldn't change when you saw your dead friend come back to life? Like you would not be the same if you saw a dead friend come back to life. Yeah, you wouldn't be the same. And there's one particular person that wasn't the same, and, and it's our last person that we're gonna talk about, and his name is Peter. Peter's my God. Like, like, I find if there's any biblical character that is most like me, it's Peter, okay? Peter is the loud mouth friend. He's the one that's always passionate, and he's like, okay, let's go, right? Like, I mean, he is, he's always down. Like, I mean, he's the guy that, that if you want to rob a bank, he's like, yeah, let's go. Like, 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 he's that guy, right? Peter was also a key leader of the church. He was a man of God. He loved Jesus. He was one of Jesus' like best friends, Peter, James, and John was like the, like the small group of the ages. I mean, they were the crew. And there was one particular moment, Jesus actually told Peter, he said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter being all outspoken and expressive, no, Jesus, no, 
no, that, that's not me. Negative, I love you, you're my God. I will protect you so much so that when Jesus was arrested, he was so passionate about it, he chopped off a dude's ear because they were arresting Jesus. I mean, this is like, this is gangster Peter, okay? And Jesus says, no, no, you're gonna deny me three times before the rooster crows. And lo and behold, as time happens, as Jesus is, is approaching the cross, as he is going to the cross, a little girl, a little bitty slave girl comes up to Peter and say, do you know that man? And Peter's like, um, uh, um, no. But like, I'm, I'm pretty sure you like, you like knew him. He, he's like, oh, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. No, no, no. I, I'm pretty sure I saw you when you were like feeding the feed loaves and fishes and stuff. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw you. He's like, no, that's not me. You got the wrong guy. I'm not with that guy. And lo and behold, he denies Jesus three times exactly what Jesus prophesied. Can you imagine the ultimate betrayal? Like, like Jesus is arrested, then tortured, and then crucified. And you, like, like Jesus didn't need your lack of loyalty at that moment. But yet in that moment, Peter denies Jesus. I mean, talking about guilt, Jesus was dead for three days and Peter sat in this feeling of guilt for three whole days. And then Jesus rose from the dead. Can you imagine what Peter is feeling? Just imagine Jesus, watch. Where's Peter? Like, can you imagine if, if Peter heard that, like, like heard Jesus was rose from the dead? Like, can you imagine the feeling of guilt that, man, I betrayed my Jesus and now he's coming back to get me? <laughs> like, can you imagine the thoughts that he was feeling? And so Jesus rose from the dead and he comes to Peter, and here's what Jesus says to Peter in John chapter 21, verse 15. And I really want you to hear this because this is probably the most beautiful just words to Peter. And Jesus says this in John chapter 21, verse 15. He says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He says, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. And then Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord. Like, like, like you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. And for the third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him for the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And what was fascinating about this is that Peter denied him three times. Then Jesus asked him, do you love me? Three times. Jesus asked Peter if he still loved him. And as humiliating and as terrible and as guilty as Peter felt denying Jesus, here was a chance to make it right. Even though Peter may have, you know, felt guilty about himself and maybe he have said, you know, I'm done. I'm done being a disciple of Jesus. I'm walking away. Jesus never gave up on him. And this is beautiful because even when Peter was at his worst moment of feeling about himself, God was still at his best is that Jesus was inviting Peter back into the story. Jesus knew that Peter betrayed him. Jesus knew that Peter felt guilty. Jesus knew that he felt far from God in that moment. And Jesus comes not to shame him or to make him feel bad or to make him feel terrible about himself or to make him feel sorry for what he's done, but he invites him, says, he says, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my lambs. Continue the story. Get up, walk, stand up, move on. Let's get up. Don't like continue to move forward. I'm inviting you back into the story. And this is beautiful because Jesus shows us that he has more grace for us than we have sin. 
Jesus shows us that he is more good than we are bad. Jesus shows us that, that the moments that we feel like running from God, that God actually runs to us. And that is the beautiful story of the Gospels, that when we were running from him, he ran to us. And we see this Jesus coming to Peter. He ran to Peter. And he said, I'm coming. I, like, 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 feed my lambs. Do you love me? We serve a God who runs to us. He finds us. He pursues us. He looks for us. And he says, feed my lambs. And while we try to show God our history and show God our past and show God the things that we've done, even yesterday, we show God this, 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 and that. And God says, see the future. See what I see in you. And then soon Peter becomes this person that God begins to build the foundation of the church. And, and Peter spreads the good news of the gospel and then sees people get saved. And, and, and he is invited back into the story where God will use him. See, Jesus didn't want Peter's life to be defined by guilt. He wanted his life to be defined by grace. And that's what grace is. Grace is God giving to us what we don't deserve. It's a second chance, it's a new beginning, it's a new start, it's, it's restoration, it's a reinstatement. And the resurrection showed Peter the power that Jesus had. See, Jesus didn't want guilt to destroy Peter's faith or what he's done or how he betrayed him to destroy his faith. Instead, he wanted grace to destroy his guilt and give him a new way forward. Because of grace, Peter was no longer controlled by, by guilt. Because of grace, Peter accepted the love of God. And because of grace, Peter traveled the whole world and told people about the story of God. See, the resurrection proves that you are forgiven. The resurrection proves that guilt is no match for grace. That, that whatever you're feeling today, whatever you've done, whatever your past was like, no matter what you did on that, on that screen yesterday or what you looked at or who you talked to or who you sent that to, whatever it is, God invites you back into the story. You see, you were created for so much more than to stay in guilt and shame. You were created way more than just to be defined by your mistakes or defined by what makes you guilty. You see, guilt doesn't have the last word. God wants to have the last word. God wants his grace to be the last word over your life. And no matter what you're feeling, God invites you as he did with Peter. And he says, you are forgiven. He says, do you love me? Daughter, do you love me? But God, I, I, I did this, but no, no. do you love me? But, but God, I, I made a mistake. I, I, I did, I'm, a, I'm a terrible person, but do you love me? And this is, this is beautiful because it's way more about him than it is about you. See, God invites you to see Jesus for who he really is as a forgiver, as, a, as, a, as, as gracious, as loving, as full of hope and peace. God invites you to look at him and not just your sin. And yes, we confess and we repent and we turn. But while we do that, we look at the one who gives us a second chance and says, do you love me? Feed my lambs. God comes to you. And he invites you into the story. You were created to be a part of God's story. I don't know what you're feeling today. Maybe you feel guilt or maybe you don't. May this truth sink so deep in our hearts that you don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to run from God anymore. You don't have to avoid God and avoid eye contact and, and don't talk to him and, and ghost him anymore. You know why? Because God invites you to experience grace. Don't hide. Open yourself to him. Get honest. Get real. And maybe that means you speaking to like your small group leader and saying, hey, I'm really struggling. I'm really having a hard time believing that there's still good in me. Because the resurrection proves that there is still good in you. It proves 
that you are forgiven. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father God, we thank you for the grace of God. God, we thank you that it is the resurrection that proves that we are forgiven and that our guilt is no match for your grace. And so God, right now, right now as these students are watching this, we open up our hearts right now to receive your grace. Lord, we confess where we have done wrong. We confess our guilt. We confess the, the shame and the wrong thing that we've done. God, we don't want to be that person anymore. We want to change. We want to be different. We want to be the person that you've called us to be. And so, God, we say yes. We say yes. We do love you. We do appreciate you. We do thank you. We, our life is yours. Our life does belong to you. And so, God, we choose to be in the story. We choose to not quit. We choose to not give up. So, Lord, we love you today. We praise you. We thank you for this series. We thank you for the reminders that we are loved, that we matter, and that we are forgiven. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.